Hello, and welcome to the 2019 EBSS Virtual Research Forum, which offers librarians an opportunity to present current research. In the past, we've held this event in person at ALA Annual, but as the work of our section moves increasingly online and many of our members are unable to attend Annual, we decided to move this forum online too, and we hope we can include more people this way. My name is Samantha Godby, and I am chair of this year's EBSS Research Committee, which organizes this event each year. In case you're new to EBSS, we're the Education and Behavioral Sciences section of ACRL. Formed in 1968, EBSS has about 1,000 members, and we're always looking for more members interested in education and behavioral sciences librarianship. I'd like to acknowledge this year's research committee, which as I've said, organizes this event, organizes this event each year, uh, including reviewing all the, the proposals we receive. I'd also like to thank APA for their continued support of EBSS. They're a big supporter of the work we do in this section. Um, and I'd like to uh, encourage you to consider applying for one of their librarian conference travel awards. They award $750 three times each year, and there's no limitation on which conferences are eligible for funding. Uh, so on this slide, you can see the application deadlines, and there's more information on their website. As an example of APA's support, they're generously providing snack boxes to two of today's attendees. We'll randomly select two winners and contact you via email. Uh, I will say there's an image here, but uh, this is not exactly what you will receive if you're selected. We decided instead of having one big box to have two winners of smaller boxes. So at the end of today's session, we'll provide a link to a survey. You can enter your email there and also give us feedback on today's event. This is the list of today's presentations each of which was selected via a competitive blind review process. The committee looks for original research that measures or investigates issues of high interest to librarians, especially librarians in education and behavioral sciences. And we're very excited about the presentations we have for you today. Uh, as you can see, we have four presentations and each, present, each presenter will have 10 minutes to present. We'll do all four presentations and then have time for questions at the end. You can put any questions along the way in the chat box, but we will wait until the end of all four presentations to respond and discuss. And with that, let's get started. So first off, we have Dr. Karen Kaufman from Seminole State College of Florida. So Karen, please make sure to unmute your mic. Great, is that better? Can everyone hear? Yes, thank better? you. Great, thank you, Samantha. Thank you so much for um, that introduction and Elois. Um, as, uh, first of all, good afternoon and uh, thank you for joining us. As uh, Samantha mentioned, I'm Karen Kaufman, professor and faculty librarian at Seminole State College of Florida. Um, the title of my presentation is College Student Perceptions of the Relevance of Information Literacy to Their Academic Work. This presentation will introduce findings from my recent doctoral research investigating the relevance of information literacy to college students when applied to an academic assignment or task. The research design was a two-stage sequential mixed methods pragmatic study using relevance theory as the theoretical framework. If you could advance the slide, please. Thank you. So the primary research question for this study asks, how is information literacy relevant from a sociocognitive user view to undergraduate student academic work? You can see on the slide that this included um, two stages in the sequence. Stage one was an online survey and participants identified their perceptions of the relevance of information literacy when applied to an academic assignment. The second stage, or stage two, used focus groups, which identified factors that make information literacy relevant to academic work. 
So in order to measure user relevance, it was essential to operationalize terms and to define sociocognitive relevance. There are two prongs to sociocognitive relevance situated in relevance theory, the communicative or socio prong and then the cognitive prong. So the term usefulness relating to the notion of value or essentiality was used to measure the communicative or socio prong. The term meaningfulness relating to importance was used to measure the cognitive prong. These terms were more fully defined in the study for users. This study also information literacy competencies specific to higher education were described using the recently adopted ACRL framework and threshold concepts in combination with the ACRL standards. If you could please advance the slide. Thank you. So let's take a look at the stage one survey and key findings that um, came out of that um, stage of the investigation. First, uh, the survey identified that information literacy is perceived as sociocognitively relevant or useful and meaningful when used for an academic assignment by college students. Students also uh, perceive that information literacy is highly relevant to their academic work. Another key finding was that user relevance of information literacy is not bound according to student perceptions by age or gender or academic status, their academic program, student status, required sources for, um, for an assignment, and then also perceptions of information literacy, their own perception of improvement of information literacy to complete an assignment. This was um, important because uh, previous information literacy studies had looked at some of these demographic types of variables as perhaps impactful. And this study of user relevance uh, found that these weren't really factors that were significant. In the bottom corner of this slide, you'll see a quote from Tefko Sarasivic, who's done quite a bit of research and writing in regarding or surrounding relevance, mostly system relevance, but also user relevance. And he says that relevance is timeless and that concerns about relevance will always be timely. Before moving ahead, I just want to note that um, this survey included 139 participants. The survey was developed and piloted and then a test retest criteria was used um, to verify reliability. The pilot survey also served to affirm validity of defined variables and operational terms. Next slide. So let's take a look at the stage two focus group findings as well. What were the factors or what are the factors that make information literacy relevant to college students? So in this investigation, four focus groups were used and the factors were identified using thematic analysis of the qualitative data. Trustworthiness of data was reviewed and evaluated for credibility, transferability, dependability, and confirmability. So go ahead and sort of peruse this slide. And, and as you do, I'd like to just share that the factors that make information literacy useful and meaningful to students are dimensional, dynamic, variegated, and diverse, while at the same time are intertwined and influence the impact, the usefulness and meaningfulness of information literacy when applied to their academic work. So the relationship between these factors might be described as a kaleidoscope, reflective and intertwined. You'll see that there um, was one, what I call an uber factor, or overarching factor is knowledge, their knowledge base, student knowledge base, nine key factors, and then 11 dimensional factors. So the factor relationships are non-hierarchical in the traditional sense, but they're boundaryless and they're evidenced as related and reflective in what I call a diffused hierarchy. So hierarchy typically means a higher to lower order or rank of factors. Whereas diffusion lends to the meaning of spontaneous movement of any kind or type of factor, but stemming from a shared origin. And the shared origin of relationship is their knowledge base. 
So it's from their knowledge base that all factors share a commonality or origin. The key and dimensional factors are spontaneously present in the student experience or perception of information literacy. So the spontaneous presence reflects a metacognitive way that students experience and perceive information literacy to be useful and meaningful to their academic work. Next slide. So finally, finally let's take a, a quick look at some discussion points and implications of these findings. First, these findings um, may um, enrich information literacy. Poll and Payne tell us the most prominent and consistent determinant of information literacy competencies is student perception. This infers that perceptions are a determining factor of information literacy. Therefore, when IL is perceived by users as relevant, then relevance is also a determining factor of information literacy for students. Second, let's look at user relevance as a pragmatic building block of sociocognitive relevance and in information science. Vanderhint, Sperber, and Polster tell us the relevance of a piece of information is relevance to its user. This infers that relevance can be user-defined. And this user-based study found that user perceptions could be both defined and measured when there are well-defined and operationalized terms. Finally, knowing student perceptions of the relevance of information literacy can facilitate student success in academic work. Perceptions are important because they make up or influence our internal organization of data. The combination of the quantitative and qualitative data provides a new baseline of user relevance understanding for information literacy. For instance, using the factors of user relevance to build awareness while developing information literacy instruction and perhaps applying these factors of user relevance to other disciplines could be useful. We can now know these factors matter to students and we can raise awareness of the kaleidoscope metacognitive experiences students have while engaging in their research process for academic work. Next slide. Thank you so much for listening. And here is a list um, of references if interested. And um, I know we'll address comments and questions at the end and uh, feel free to reach out later via my email. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, and our next presenter is Dana Staten Thompson from Murray State University. Hey, everybody. Um, my name is Dana Thompson. I work at Murray State University as a research and instruction librarian, and I am the liaison for the College of Business. So just a little bit about me. I have my MFA in photography and my MA in art history in addition to my MLIS. These degrees have influenced my interest in visual literacy as a research topic, and that interest was further solidified when I found the ACRL visual literacy standards early in my career. Uh, now, I've only been an academic librarian for two and a half years, so not that long ago. Um, these standards, for those of y'all that are unfamiliar, were created in 2011 to align to the information literacy standards from 2000. They have performance indicators and learning objectives just like the original standards, and they work great for assessment and empirical research. Um, a little bit about visual literacy itself before we dive into my project in particular. Um, from the introduction of the visual literacy standards, they state, the importance of images and visual media in contemporary culture is changing what it means to be literate in the 21st century. Today, society is highly visual and visual imagery is no longer supplemental to other forms of information. The standards also define visual literacy as a set of abilities that enables an individual to effectively find, interpret, evaluate, use, and create images and visual media. Um, last January, I applied to the Institute for Research Design and Librarianship to better understand how students were using images in their work. Uh, IRDL was a fantastic immersive experience and uh, we learned how to conduct qualitative and quantitative studies and a whole lot more. Um, that project morphed into the study I'm presenting on today, Librarians' Current Perceptions and Use of the ACRL Visual Literacy Standards. Next slide. 
So um, the overall goal of this research project is to describe the domains and contexts in which the visual literacy standards are used to ground research and to provide a current state of the visual literacy standards and how they're being used by academic librarians. Part of this research examines how aware librarians are that these standards exist and it explores what other barriers might affect the usage of those standards. All right. So for this study, I'm using a mixed methods approach, which includes a content analysis, a survey, and interviews. The content analysis includes approximately 150 articles found through Google Scholar that I found by searching for the phrase ACRL Visual Literacy Standards. Uh, these articles all reference the standards, either as background information in the literature review, as a footnote, foot, ah, footnote, or as the basis for the research. The survey was posted to about 10 different online listservs in the fall of 2018, and I used a non-probability sampling technique. Uh, after cleaning up the data, I have approximately 146 responses to work with. 14 of those respondents left their contact information on the survey. I followed up with those folks and I conducted semi-structured interviews with 10 of the 14. Now, since I didn't get all 14, I'm not sure if I'm going to qualitatively analyze the data or not, but if I do, I'll use an inductive open coding process to identify the emerging themes and sub-themes. Um, I may just end up using the quotes from interviews, though, to illustrate points I make about the findings. Next slide. So apologies, there's a lot of information here, but uh, here are the preliminary findings for my content analysis. So um, I looked at about six different aspects of these articles. So what type of article was it? Is it a case study? Was it empirical research or was it a perspective piece? What type of publication was it? So was it a dissertation, a trade article, conference proceedings, book chapter, or journal article? Um, how did the article use the standards? So were they mentioning them? Did they base it on it? Or was it just a reference? And was the article library related or not? So what discipline was it coming out of? Uh, and finally, I looked at where the author was located and what year the article was published. So as you can see, for the most part, the articles are prospective journal articles that mention the standards in a library setting, and they're published in the United States. However, it is important to note that almost half of the articles are published outside of the field of librarianship, and over a third have used the visual literacy standards to ground their research. What's interesting is that some of these fields are related to librarianship, such as instructional design and education, but other fields such as architecture, archaeology, business, and health sciences are also interested in grounding their research in the ACRL visual literacy standards too. Um, as I move forward in my analysis, I will be breaking this category down into separate fields of study represented. Um, in terms of relevance, so there is a new ACRL visual literacy task force of which I'm a member which has been tasked with aligning the visual literacy standards to the framework. These results show that scholars are using the standards for their empirical studies, and this could influence the direction of the task force in which direction we take in realigning the standards to the framework. Next slide. So turning to the second half of my data, the survey, the most important things I found from the survey are the following. There is not a large awareness of the ACRL visual literacy standards in the academic librarian community. Instructional librarians who are aware of the standards don't feel as though they have the time to incorporate lessons teaching visual literacy into their instruction sessions. And third, librarians are beginning to understand the importance of visual literacy, but may feel uncomfortable teaching it themselves. So I have not synthesized the data yet between the survey and the content analysis but I think that it will paint an overall picture of how librarians are currently using the ACRL visual literacy standards and what they think of them if they know about them. Uh, this work also serves to educate librarians on the importance of visual literacy, especially as we live in a visual culture, which will only become more saturated with images as we move forward. Next slide. 
thank you. <laughs> uh, here is my contact information and uh, please email me if you have any questions or if you would like to just discuss visual literacy and librarianship in the future. Thank you so much for your time. Excellent. Thank you, Dana. Um, and we will move on to our next presenter, Michelle Kiba from Palm Beach Atlantic University. Hello, everyone. My name is Michelle Kiba, and I'm Associate Librarian for Reference at Palm Beach Atlantic University, which is a private liberal arts university in Southeast Florida. Today, I'll be discussing the preliminary results of my study on curiosity during the research process. And I first became really curious about curiosity. A few years ago, I attended a workshop at the 2016 ESOL conference. So I wanted to mention that workshop was hosted by Hannah Gauschrumpel and Anne-Marie Dietering. And they actually wrote up an article about their findings on curiosity during the research process uh, in, in the library with the lead pipe in 2017. So if you'd like to learn more about them and their research, you can search in the library with a lead pipe, um, start sparking curiosity, and you'll find that study coming up. I also want to mention, if you have any questions about my study or about conducting research in general, please feel free to reach out to me via email or Twitter. You have my contact information here. Like Dana, I was also a member of the Institute for Research Design and Librarianship cohort this year, and that experience was invaluable to me. Um, my mentor there and my mentors here at Palm Beach Atlantic, and I just want to encourage anyone who's interested in conducting empirical research to uh, take that on. It's a it's an exciting and interesting process, and I'm happy to help out, um, and you're welcome to reach out to me if you have any questions. So moving on to my study, the goal of my study was to understand the role epistemic curiosity plays in the research process in order to inform how librarians and teaching faculty can best design research assignments to harness curiosity. So in other words, what role does curiosity play in that process? Is it something positive? Is it something that invokes anxiety? And then once we know more, how can we apply that to help students uh, better perform in their research assignments? Within that goal, I had three objectives. First, I wanted to assess the impact epistemic curiosity has on students' information literacy self-efficacy. Second, I wanted to assess the impact epistemic curiosity has on the quality of student research assignments. And third, I wanted to describe the advantages and disadvantages of epistemic curiosity during the research process from the student's perspectives. Next slide. So I took those three objectives and I translated them into three research questions, two of which are quantitative and one which is qualitative. And as I developed these research questions, I had to operationally define what I meant by curiosity and information literacy self-advocacy. So I took a definition for epistemic curiosity from Lippmann in 2008. And epistemic curiosity is defined as the desire for knowledge that motivates individuals to learn new ideas, eliminate information gaps, and solve intellectual problems. And so as opposed to other types of curiosity like perceptual curiosity, epistemic curiosity has that sort of intellectual focus. That's what I wanted to hone in on for this study. Next, I took the um, definition for self-advocacy from Bandura in 1997. Self-advocacy is defined as a belief in one's capabilities to organize and execute the course of action required to attain a goal. So in other words, um, what are their beliefs about their ability to complete a task? So with those two variables defined, I really wanted to know do students who score at a high level on the epistemic curiosity questionnaire also score higher on the information literacy self-efficacy scale? So in other words, are students who are more curious also, do they tend to have a higher level of information literacy self-efficacy? And then do students who score at a high level on the epistemic curiosity questionnaire also score higher on their annotated bibliographies as rated on the information literacy value rubric? So again, I wanted to know, do students who score higher on epistemic curiosity also do better on a research assignment? Then I also wanted to look qualitatively at how students describe their feelings of epistemic curiosity as they relate to the research process to get a fuller, fuller picture of what students were experiencing and what they were going through. Next slide. 
So next, I want to tell you a little bit about the methodology of the study. So this was a mixed method study, meaning that it incorporated both quantitative and qualitative components. And the population was our non-traditional undergraduate students. Um, so those are students who take classes in the evening or online. Uh, usually they're a bit older than our traditional undergraduate day students, usually 24 years or older, uh, usually working full time and then taking classes at night or online, like I mentioned. Uh, this was the fall 2018 and spring 2019 semesters of their required academic research techniques course. And I had a total of 59 participants that uh, started the class, took the survey, and completed the class and submitted their annotated bibliography at the end, which was a 97% response rate of the population. I collected data from three sources. I had a survey that they completed at the beginning of the course that was comprised of two validated scales designed to measure my variables. So I used the Epistemic Curiosity Questionnaire from Lippmann in 2008. And I um, also measured information literacy self-efficacy from 2006. The second piece of information was the annotated bibliography. That was the student's final assignment in the course, and they were able to choose a research topic of their own choice. I evaluated all of those bibliographies on the information literacy value rubric. And then finally, I did in-depth interviews uh, via phone, in person, and email with any students who were interested, which led to a total of 24 interviews. Next, I'll be giving you my preliminary analysis of the, both the quantitative and qualitative data. I have finished collecting the data, but I am still in the depths of the analysis, so you'll see my preliminary findings. Next slide. All right, so here we have the beginnings of the quantitative data analysis. So I used linear regression analysis to look at the relationship between the variables that I wanted to measure. So I compared epistemic curiosity to information literacy self-efficacy, which you see charted here. And for this relationship, I did find that there was a small relationship. The R square was 0.26. So you can see on the chart here, these blue diamonds represent the actual recorded values, and the orange squares represent the predicted values based on the multiple linear regression analysis that was performed. Um, so there is some relationship. An R squared 0.26 means that epistemic curiosity explains about 26% of the variation in the dependent variable, which is information literacy self-advocacy. But when I compared the other variables, when I compared epistemic curiosity to their um, scores on the value rubric, so their ability on the research assignment, there was not a relationship. And then when I compared information literacy self-efficacy to the scores on the assignment, there was not a relationship there either. So the initial analysis says that there might be um, a small relationship between epistemic curiosity and information literacy self-efficacy, but then it doesn't translate um, to performance on the annotated bibliography. Now, the quantitative analysis is only one part of the study, one half of the coin, I suppose you could say. So I also want to mention the preliminary findings from the qualitative data analysis. Next slide. So I did inductive coding on the interviews, and I have finished coding all of the interviews from the fall semester. I'm in the process of coding the interviews from the spring semester and should finish them this month. But these were the initial codes that arose. Um, this is a frequency of the top five codes. There's about 30 total. And these have the highest number of mentions from the students. You can see the one that was most mentioned in the interviews was having a personal connection to the topic. All of the students talked about being interested and curious about their topic of their assignment. Some even talked about wanting to investigate it beyond the class. So having this personal connection was key to engaging their interests. But another thing that had a very big role was professor guidance. A lot of times students mentioned that their topics were too broad at first. They were interested, they were curious about their topics, but it was important that the professor guided them and helped them narrow down their topic into a thesis that could be researched. And then once they had that thesis that was uh, narrowed and researchable, they really wanted to go deeper and dig into that topic. And many of them mentioned 
the importance of finding a relevant source. Once they knew what they wanted to research and were curious about it, it was very important that they got a source that answered their information need as opposed to just one to fulfill the assignment. So those are the initial results of my study. I will be writing up my conclusions this summer and submitting them for publication. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, and we will move on to our final presentation for today. We have Scott Marsalis from University of Minnesota, Twin Cities. Good afternoon. First, a little bit about myself. I'm a librarian at the University of Minnesota, and I serve as liaison to three departments, social work, family social science, and kinesiology. I recently co-authored a scoping review with a research team in our school, it's called Social Work, and I'm currently a member on five synthesizing review teams with studies and process. I'm also uh, the founder and co-convener of ACRL's new Systematic Reviews and Related Methods Interest Group. Today I'm reporting on an ongoing project looking at the adoption of systematic reviews and other synthesizing review methods in the discipline of social work, the quality of the reported search methods and whether the involvement of librarians has an impact on the quality. Synthesizing reviews are a group of methodologies that synthesize the existing evidence on a topic in a way that maximizes rigor and minimizes bias. Some of the methods which have been increasingly adopted in the behavioral sciences include systematic reviews, meta-analyses, scoping reviews, mapping reviews, and rapid reviews. There are also a group of methods that synthesize qualitative evidence, such as meta-ethnography and qualitative interpretive meta-synthesis. One thing that all synthesizing methods have in common is that their data set is, compr is comprised of existing research and a transparent, reproducible, and typically exhaustive search is required. Because of this, standards typically recommend the involvement of a librarian on the research team. A poor search that fails to identify all the relevant studies results in a poor data set, and the conclusions of the synthesis may be faulty. My investigation into the uptake and quality of synthesizing re reviews in social work is rooted in similar studies in various health science fields. And these found that search reporting is frequently poor in systematic reviews and meta-analyses, and which is pretty much the, um, what the two methods that they looked at. And that formal involvement of a librarian often correlates with higher quality. Next slide, please. So my study looked at three questions. What types of synthesizing reviews are being published in social work? Whether the reviews follow established guidelines for reporting literature search? And whether the reported involvement of a librarian predicts the quality of search reporting? Next slide. In order to identify published synthesizing reviews in the field of social work, I conducted a search in Scopus, Web of Science, and Social Work Abstracts, covering the years 2010 to 2017. And although I would typically choose other databases for a topical search in social work, uh, I chose these because of their, co their coverage of the core social work journals and the ability to search on author affiliation keywords, at least in Web of Science. In addition to searching on a set of keywords relating to specific synthesizing review methods, I look for variations of the term social work in the journal title, in the title or abstract, or the author's credentials, resulting in 1,095 unique studies. My inclusion criteria for belonging to the discipline of social work included being in a journal with social work in its title, at least one of the authors having a social work degree, or working in a social work department, or the social work context being clearly called out in the title or abstract. When I screened those 1,095 titles and abstracts, the set was reduced down to 332. Most were excluded as not being a, a synthesizing review or not truly being in social work, but either included the phrase in a minor way, like a tossaway sentence at the end about something about implications for social workers, or because the author's institution combines social work in the college name along with another, other disciplines such as nursing or education, and the content clear, clearly belonged to the other field. When I had any uncertainty, I researched the author's credentials online. I then used a short form to extract data from this set, identifying the synthesis methodology, the acknowledged involvement of a librarian, whether the search was reproducible, and I checked against a short list of common reporting issues. The final set of studies with a reproducible search strategy was then screened along, using a longer form for data extraction based on an instrument developed by a researcher in health science librarianship, which was itself derived from uh, the PRESS instrument, which stands for Peer Review of Electronic Search Strategies. Next slide. 
So most studies stated that they were a systematic review with scoping reviews, meta-analyses, and qualitative metasynthesis of some sort being less common. I did not do any evaluation on whether the studies truly matched their self-identified method. Um, and I would not be surprised if many that call themselves a systematic review, especially older ones, um, actually would fall into a, a different category. Um, also, at the stage of coding, discovered that over half of the reviews did not report that their search methods, did not report their search methods in enough detail to be reproducible. Next slide, please. Very few authors formally acknowledge the involvement of a librarian. This is likely an underreporting, and more probably did consult with a librarian, but didn't mention it as um, is required in most standards. But less than three librarians listed as co-authors is worrying, as is having only eight studies acknowledging a librarian as actually designing or conducting the searches. Ideally, a librarian conducts the searches, documents the search in the methods section, and is listed as a co-author. When this doesn't happen, the authors should at least consult with a librarian on search design and clearly state that they did this in their methods section. Next slide, please. From personal experience and based on others' research, I included in the short form the most expected common mistakes that would make a search not reproducible. Most commonly, the authors did not include the complete Boolean logic. They also commonly omitted the platform, which can affect the results. For example, if you search PsycInfo in um, Ovid or on APA's native platform or on EBSCO, the um, interface can return different um, results. Also, quite a few conflated the database and platform, stating, for example, we searched EBSCO, and a few have neglected to name the databases at all. Another error that turned out to be common um, was not listing all the search keywords. However, because I didn't anticipate this when I was designing the instrument, it wasn't included in the short form checklist. Next slide, please. The set of studies where the search was reproducible comprised the final data set and was coded using an instrument derived for standards for reporting search strategies for systematic reviews. My form was modified from the one developed by health science librarians, uh, primarily Melissa uh, Retlifson, because social science databases were more varied than Medline and the features offered and the utility of their control vocabulary when at the source is even offered. Most studies did do a good job of searching appropriate text fields, for example, not relying unduly on just the title. They also usually included at least some appropriate synonyms for their keyword terms. Most also incorporated truncation appropriately. However, a disturbing majority neglected to customize their search to each database or to utilize the database's control vocabulary when one was available. And almost half had some other um, serious errors, such as an overly simplistic search strategy that could negatively impact the data informing the review. One question from the press instrument that I did include in the long form that proved to be problematic is whether limits or filters were used where available. Press was developed in health science librarianship where the dominant databases all use limits effectively. However, this largely isn't true in the behavioral sciences outside of psych info. Moreover, the terminology is confusing as filters is also used to mean what I would call a hedge, pre-developed and often validated searches. Since these aren't common, um, as common in social work or other social sciences, inclusion really doesn't make sense um, in, the, in retrospect. These initial results suggest that social work authors of synthesizing reviews do a very poor job in documenting the searches to identify their data set. And when enough details are included to reproduce the search, too many strategies are inadequate to the task. However, because so few studies appear to have involved a librarian, it is unclear whether doing so would necessarily fix the problems. For example, the three studies with librarian co-authors, two had gold standard searches and documentation, while one was very poor. There are a couple of issues that I'm navigating as I consider my next steps. First, I cut off my searches in 2017 because I wanted to have a clean cutoff date for inclusion and I was doing my data poll in summer of 2018. However, I'm considering going back and searching for 2018 studies. I expect that the number of published reviews in social work increased last year and that the quality may have increased as well. Secondly, my instruments were not validated. And in fact, the press instrument that lies behind it um, isn't validated either, despite some authors using it claiming otherwise. An updated version of press has recently been released and next month, a more robust standard for reporting searches for systematic reviews called Prisma S is due to be released. When I asked a colleague to screen a sample using my long form, we had poor inter-rater reliability. So there's some work to do on uh, developing and elucidating the scale. 
So I'm considered returning to my data extraction stage with additional validation to make sure the methods are, are fully robust. However, in the, even these preliminary results have implications for the quality of synthesizing reviews published in social work. Journal editors and peer reviewers need to show the same level of rigor in, requiring, in considering the steps taken to identify the re relevant studies to include in the synthesizing reviews as they do to other aspects of the study. And the case may be made that they should consider having information professionals peer review the search methods section of all synthesized review manuscripts. This also means that social science librarians need to improve our understanding of synthesizing methods and reporting standards and advocate for our own involvement on synthesizing review teams with our faculty. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, and so that is uh, the last of our presentations for today. And at this time, we have um, time for questions from uh, the attendees. So if you have questions for any of our presenters, uh, I have their presentation uh, titles and contact information on the screen. Obviously, you can follow up with them um, after today if you'd like, but We'd also like to have a bit more discussion now. So if you have any questions for the presenters, you can type them in the chat box. Uh, be sure to um, select all panelists and attendees uh, before, you, before you click send uh, so that it goes to everyone. And I have a question uh, to get folks started. <laughs> um, I wonder, so each of our um, presenters, you each had very different research methodologies. Um, so I think many of our attendees um, will have conducted empirical research of their own, um, but many, many may be curious about uh, conducting research. So I wonder if each of you could talk about uh, the method you, that you chose and any um, anything you might share about that method, whether it's challenges you experienced or things that you really like about it that you plan to do again. Um, I can start. Um, so when I decided to do a content analysis, we actually lost access to our a few library specific databases and so it made it easy for my content analysis like I'm going to use Google Scholar so in that way it was easy to um, to understand what resource I was going to do for my searching um, <coughs> excuse me um, one of the unanticipated things with the um, survey is that people who did agree to speak with me after I thought that I would get, you know, the, the, the 14 interviews and didn't. And so um, since I don't have, you know, the 14, I'm unsure about using the 10 to do a qualitative analysis on. So I just don't know if I have the enough data to do it. So that's kind of a, a small stumbling block and something I'm trying to figure out uh, because of that particular method. Um, I would say when you are doing survey design, um, test and test it again with um, smaller populations who are not necessarily your target audience um, and make sure you've included everything you need to. Because um, if you don't have the good data in, you know, then you won't get good data out of it. And that would be my suggestions. Uh, this is Scott. Um, so yeah, so uh, one of the challenges I always face doing research is that I, you know, had no training in um, research methods at all in either undergraduate or graduate school. So I kind of self-taught and flying by the seat of my pants a lot. Um, and I end up um, having to pull in because of the, just the, the um, the way thing, the involvement. So I based my research on on kind of um, the research of others, and the but because there are so few of librarians being acknowledged, my um, spread was kind of skewed, and so I ended up consulting with um, 
a office on campus that opened up after I had started on um, that does consulting on statistics and research methods. And that consultant is the one that kind of um, suggested I, you know, pull in some others for validating my instrument. So, um, which I think, you know, ultimately is, is means I'm going to end up having to kind of go back and, and um, start again in the middle. Um, but um, I'm learning as I go, and I, I think it's going to end up being more valid. This is Michelle. Um, I originally had planned the study to be just a qualitative study, uh, and then being part of the IRDL, uh, there's a process you go through of um, working through and on your study, and that's when I added the quantitative component. Now, normally, I would use the quantitative quantitative survey data to choose the participants for the interviews. Um, but because I had a small sample size, I just chose to interview anybody who was interested. Um, but ideally, I would have taken the results from the survey and then interviewed um, participants of with different levels of curiosity and self-efficacy. Sure. This is this is Karen, um, but I think there's a question in the chat for Scott that. Maybe... Well, Karen, why don't you go ahead and respond to this one, and we'll we'll go to that question next. Okay. Okay. Sure. So, um, uh, my uh, I I would first of all um, echo the um, comments already from the other presenters, meaning, you know, the value of piloting surveys, um, the value of uh, reaching out for uh, support from, you know, others around us who have uh, either research methods experience or um, data analysis um, tools and experience that, that we can learn from. I think those are really, really valuable. And also, um, from what Michelle said, um, I too did a mixed method study, and so um, the sequencing I found to, uh, you know, using the survey and then some of my focus group participants had taken the survey and some had not, um, but using um, the survey to inform the focus group questions and then um, the way in which the data was rather circular uh, for data analysis from both the survey and focus groups. Um, really provided a rich, rich um, collection of data to uh, draw conclusions and um, do, do analysis that was, um, I felt anyway, very, very rich, uh, particularly for my topic. Relevance is sort of a, a difficult, <laughs> difficult uh, concept uh, for investigation, particularly user relevance. So um, that was, that was I, I would echo all of those, those comments. Thank you. Um, so yes, there is. There are a couple questions for Scott in the chat box. So I'll just uh, read those out. Um, the first is, what strategies would you suggest to convince faculty to include librarians? And two, being the librarian on one of those reviews takes a huge amount of time. Many of us are supporting multiple departments with limited time. Any suggestions for how to manage that? And then a related question, um, about whether your university offers a credit bearing course um, and whether you co teach on um, conducting meta analyses, meta syntheses, and such. Sure. Um, first of all, I need to apologize for my phone never rings, and of course it would ring during this webinar. So I apologize for that if it was bleeding through. Um, so the strategies, um, the, I think, so we fortunately we st ended up starting a, a formal service on campus to support systematic reviews outside of um, the health sciences. And so having that kind of support structure has really been helpful for us to kind of like figure out how to scale and, and promote. Um, though I think the biggest strategy has just been word of mouth. So I was, um, you know, in my beginning of the year uh, faculty blast of things that librarians can do to help them you know, I included something about um, helping with systematic reviews, and one of my faculty members happened to see that was starting a review, invited me in, 
and the success of that one um, led to the, to the next. And then um, that um, scoping review I mentioned at the beginning has gotten a lot of, of um, successful attention and that's led to the others. So, um, you know, general, the same kind of promotion you would do with any of the other services is kind of the strategy f um, for getting word out and then um, just success, uh, being able to talk about the fact that, you know, the importance of synthesizer review, you know, the data set is finding all the literature and, and that's our expertise. Um, regarding, the, you know, scalability and time, um, it is, it can be a huge time commitment and I'm still kind of learning on how to set boundaries in terms of what my roles will be on any review. Um, I've let it bleed sometimes into probably uh, more involvement than is quite appropriate. Um, since I'm not a content expert. Um, but in, um, for me, well, first of all, it's my passion. And secondly, you know, I, especially if it's a turns to a co-authorship, um, you know, it's part of my job expectations. And so if that means that I spend time on evenings and weekends working on it, um, you know, that it's the same as it would be doing, you know, for conducting my own research when there isn't time in the workday. So um, it's just kind of like that, constant negotiate, negotiation of work-life balance. Um, and regarding Olga's question about the credit bearing courses, um, they just hired a meta and an analyst in our um, ed psych department teaching an advanced statistics class. Um, though I'm not the liaison to that department um, and I'm not sure if um, my colleague who does support ed psych is, is quite knowledgeable in systematic reviews as well um, and does work with them. So um, as far as I know, she has not been asked to, to uh, do a, like a drop in, but I'm not sure about that. Yeah, thank you, Scott. I think it, I find it really interesting that you guys have started a service specifically for non-health sciences faculty, because I know um, this is Samantha. I'm at University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and we are certainly on our campus seeing a lot more interest in conducting systematic reviews outside of health sciences and I'm the education and psychology librarian and um, we are having a lot of discussions in the library about how to how to deal with the increasing requests we're seeing um, but it's you know we need to figure out ways to have it be sustainable as you said. So um, so I say that I mentioned earlier there is now an ACRL interest group um, and I invite anyone interested in to, um, this topic to join that um, and we just did a, a uh, piloted a institute, two day institute for librarians and supporting reviews and, and possibly starting services. And um, we're hoping that ACRL might consider taking that up as a roadshow. So um, stay tuned and um, feel free to, to uh, PM me as well. Thanks. Uh, Karen, there's a question for you. Um, about whether any of the students in your study admitted to using YouTube, streaming media, et cetera, to support their academic work? Sure, yeah. Um, in the survey, there was a question about uh, the kind of sources that they had required for their assignment. Um, um, and media was one of the options, and then of course they could uh, put other, but it wasn't really that granular of a question for them to identify, for instance, you know, YouTube or, uh, you know, a specific type of streaming media. It was, it was pretty general. So um, it, the required course uh, sources were asked about, um, but uh, that, that specificity was, was not um, uncovered unless it was in the other, they just put it in there. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, another um, question. Uh, someone asked to about your um, interest group. Scott, can you just repeat that? Sure. So the um, ACRL. So it's um, it's the ACRL interest group on systematic reviews and related methods, um, and we focus on non health sciences. Though some of the members are from health sciences, um, or have multiple um, disciplines. So if you go into your ACRL membership and um, go in as if you were to renew, you can go in and add the interest group 
Um, and there's also a separate listserv that you have to join separately. Um, so even if you don't want to, if you're not a member of ACRL, um, you can join that as well. Thanks. And uh, a question for all panelists. Uh, what support do you need as a researcher to conduct successful research? I have problem with my workload and securing research assistance. Um, so for me personally, um, I don't have research assistance. Um, <laughs> but that would be awesome. Uh, but so for me, what works in terms of support is knowing that my dean supports my research. I'm tenure track, so we have uh, research requirements, but being able to block off time specifically for research in my day. So um, I've tried doing it differently. I've tried to block out, you know, Fridays for research days. It rarely works out that I get a full day to um, devote to research. And so I find hours here and there in the day when I'm not doing everything else. Um, something that's also really helpful is finding like-minded people who are working on the same types of things that you are or who are interested in doing the same types of research you're doing. So maybe you're a health sciences librarian doing qualitative research, but you don't need to find another health sciences librarian necessarily, just somebody else who's doing qualitative research. So if there are any articles you read that involve empirical research, I would reach out to the, the authors of that study and be like, hey, I'm interested in doing something similar. Do you have any pointers? Um, I know that ACRL has several mentor programs and I've been a part of a few of those. So does the uh, college uh, section, I believe, college library section. Um, so finding a mentor, somebody to help you, somebody just to bounce ideas off of if there's nobody at your institution who's doing something similar. Uh, that's what I would say. And I think that is an excellent note to wrap up, um, wrap up the, the event with. Um, and I know, so the contact information for all the presenters is here on this slide. Um, any of, you know, any of us would be happy to answer questions afterwards. Um, and yes, like it's, it's really important that um, we support each other as we, as we do explore research in, um, in these fields. And um, to wrap up, um, thanks again for attending and thank you to all of our presenters. Um, I hope you, like, um, like I and the, the committee, are all um, pleased with, impressed by the research that these, these presenters have done. I'm really um, appreciative that they, they were able to share their work with us today. Uh, and um, on the slide, there is the link to that feedback form. And again, that's where you can enter your email address for those snack boxes that APA is going to send out to two lucky attendees. Uh, the link is also pasted into the chat box um, for you there, but we'd really appreciate any feedback that you have for today. Uh, and again, there's my contact info, my email address there if you have any questions for me. Um, but again, thank you so much. and. Enjoy the rest of your day.